Assalamu alaikum and welcome students. This is a program in a series covering FSC physics syllabus. In today's program, we will discuss a few topics of thermodynamics, which is a branch of physics which deals with heat and its conversion into other forms of energy. In today's program, we will discuss the topics which are heat engines, second law of thermodynamics, refrigerator and heat pump, and entropy. We will start our discussion with the heat engine. What is a heat engine? This is the first question that comes to our mind as soon as we hear the words heat engine. Behind me on the screen you can see a schematic diagram of a heat engine. It, a, it is a device which converts heat gained from a high temperature reservoir into useful work and rejects the remaining part to a reservoir at a lower temperature. A very good example of heat engine is a car engine. Let's look at a car engine which is a good example of heat engine. Here is the car engine. It receives fuel which may be petrol, gas or diesel. Here CNG is present in this case. This is the combustion chamber. In it, the fuel is burned. The gases are produced in this chamber as a result of burning of fuel are at a very high temperature. So, we use this chamber as a high temperature reservoir. The gases present in this chamber have a lot of heat energy. Engine below this chamber receives this energy and is converts it into useful work that is turning of wheels which moves the car. Let's go back to the second law of thermodynamics which tells us that there must be some heat rejected to the sink. Where is the sink at which the car engine loses its heat? Look at this pipe coming out from the engine. The water is contained in this pipe. It absorbs some heat from the engine and brings it to the radiator. It is a fan behind the radiator which causes air to flow from the radiator and it takes heat away from it. Now the water has become cooler and it again sent to the engine Thus, a cycle is set up which makes up the cooling system of a car engine. Another good example is the steam generation unit, which converts heat in the steam into useful work, turning the turbine, and then rejects the other part to the atmosphere in the condenser. A heat engine which operates in a series of operations or processes is called a cyclic heat engine. Now we all know that a car engine repeats its cycle over and over and over again and is a good example of a cyclic heat engine. Now you can remember from the first law of thermodynamics that heat added to a system is equal to useful work and addition in the internal energy. Now we will try to use the first law and find out the efficiency of a cyclic heat engine. The internal energy of a system depends on its state and when a cyclic heat engine returns to its original state then the final internal energy is equal to initial internal energy. Hence the delta U term in the first law of thermodynamics is zero. If a heat engine absorbs heat Q1 from a high temperature reservoir and rejects heat Q2 to the low temperature reservoir, then the net heat entering the engine in a cycle is delta Q is equal to Q1 minus Q2. And therefore, the work done in a cycle W is also Q1 minus Q2. The purpose of a heat engine is to convert heat into useful work and how well it does this is its efficiency. So the more efficient engine 
converts maximum part of the heat it reserves from the heat reservoir and converts it to useful work and the heat rejected to the lower temperature reservoir is a minimum. Let's try to find the efficiency of a heat engine. The thermal efficiency of a heat engine is ratio of net work done W to the heat supplied Q1. Please see on the screen the derivation of an expression for the efficiency of a heat engine. Eta is equal to W by Q1. This implies Eta is equal to Q1 minus Q2 divided by Q1. This is equal to 1 minus Q2 divided by Q1. You can see that the efficiency of a heat engine depends on the ratio Q2 over Q1, which means it depends on the ratio of the energy it receives from the high temperature reservoir to the amount of energy it loses to the low temperature reservoir. Now for a 100% efficient engine, the heat lost should be zero. Now for all practical engines that we come across, some of the heat must be lost to the surrounding. Now this will lead us to the second law of thermodynamics, which can be stated in a number of different ways. No heat engine operating continuously in a cycle can extract heat from a heat reservoir and convert all of it into work. The second law cannot be proved directly, but experience tells us that a 100% efficient engine cannot be built. Some of the heat must be rejected to the sink. Another statement for the second law of thermodynamics is it is impossible to cause heat to flow from a cold body to a hot body without the expenditure of energy. Both of these statements are equivalent and we can show that if one is wrong, then the other is also wrong. So in other words, if we say that Kelvin is wrong, then we can show that Clausius is also wrong. Or vice versa, if we can show that Clausius is wrong, then Kelvin is also wrong. Now for a moment, let's assume that Kelvin is wrong and we can build an engine which is 100% efficient or it's an engine which takes heat from the high temperature reservoir and uses all of it and converts it into work. This schematic diagram shows a perfect engine connected to a refrigerator. The engine receives heat Q1 from the reservoir converts all of it to work W. This work is supplied to the refrigerator which uses this work to extract heat Q2 from the low temperature reservoir and supply it to the high temperature reservoir. The net effect is the transfer of heat from a low temperature reservoir to a high temperature reservoir without expenditure of work which is a clear contradiction to Clausius' statement, which said that a refrigerator cannot be built which will transfer heat from a low temperature reservoir to a high temperature reservoir without the use of external work. Now, let us suppose that Clausius' statement is wrong and we can build a refrigerator which would transfer heat from a lower temperature to a higher temperature without the need of external work. The net effect is that some energy has been used to do useful work and no part of this energy has been rejected to a low temperature sink. This is a contradiction to Kelvin's statement. So we have shown that if Kelvin is wrong, then Clausius is also wrong or vice versa. If Clausius is wrong, then Kelvin is also wrong and therefore we can say that both these statements are equivalent and both of them reinforce each other. An engine of maximum efficiency was proposed in 1824 by Sadi Carnot. Now this engine com consists of isothermal processes and adiabatic processes. What is an isothermal process? What is an adiabatic process? An isothermal process is one in which the temperature of the system remains constant. 
Example of an isothermal system is the production of steam at 100 degrees Celsius. The temperature does not change while water gets converted into steam. Similarly, the condensation of steam to produce water at 100 degrees Celsius is an example of an isothermal process. An adiabatic process is one in which no heat is added to a system or no heat is taken out of a system. So during an adiabatic process, no heat is given to the system and no heat is rejected by the system. Examples of adiabatic processes are compression of a gas so that it does not give out any heat or expansion of a gas during which it does not take in any heat. Let us look at the cycle of operations of a Carnot engine represented on a pressure volume diagram. This cycle is called the Carnot cycle. It consists of an isothermal addition of heat Q1 at temperature T1 A to B. This can be achieved by converting water to steam at a constant temperature. An adiabatic expansion B to C, this can be achieved by letting the steam procured from A to B expand in a turbine. Some useful work that is turning of the turbine is achieved here. An isothermal extraction of heat Q2 at a constant temperature T2 C to D. This may be achieved by condensing the steam at a constant temperature. And an adiabatic compression D2A, this is done by compressing the condensed water at the end of isothermal heat rejection between C to D. We have already seen that the efficiency of a heat engine is given by the ratio 1 minus Q2 over Q1. And if we represent the efficiency of a Carnot engine by eta C, then we can say that eta C is equal to 1 minus Q2 over Q1. The Carnot engine is a theoretical engine which has the maximum efficiency. And this efficiency depends on the temperatures of the high temperature reservoir and the low temperature reservoirs, T1 and T2. Now if I can make T2 equal to 0, then I would get an engine which has 100% efficiency. But we've already seen that this is not possible from second law of thermodynamics. Now I can improve the efficiency of a Carnot cycle by reducing the ratio T2 to T1. Now the efficiency only depends on the temperatures of the high temperature reservoir and the low temperature reservoir. It does not depend on the properties of the gas within the engine. So if I have a number of different Carnot cycles, I have a number of different engines that all work on the Carnot cycle and they all work between the same T1 and the same T2, then all of them should have the same efficiency. The ratio Q2 divided by Q1 is equal to ratio T2 by T1. Therefore, the efficiency of a Carnot engine would be given by eta C is equal to 1 minus T2 by T1. If a heat engine operates in the reverse and it can transfer heat from a low temperature reservoir to a high temperature reservoir with the help of some external work, then it is called a refrigerator or a heat pump. Let's look at this refrigerator. When we open it, we feel cool and the things inside are also cool. The cooling is produced in the refrigerator is due to the evaporation of liquefied gas. This liquefied gas is compressed by compressor and into the condenser and then goes to the evaporator. The gas which is refrigerant circulates around a closed loop. This loop consists of an evaporator which is inside the refrigerator, a compressor and a condenser.
The gas comes into the evaporator in a liquid form. Here it takes some heat from the objects placed in the freeze box and in the lower compartment. It leaves the evaporator as a gas. Therefore, the liquefied form changes into gas form which enters in the compressor which is at the outside of the refrigerator. It compresses the gas and increases its pressure. Through compressor, the gas enters in the condenser. Here the gas condenses in the liquid form. Condensation is the process of heat rejection. Now the refrigerant goes back to the evaporator means the freeze box and in the lower compartment and the cycle goes on. Let us now try to figure out how well a refrigerator work. Now, in the heat engine, we defined efficiency as the amount of work done and the ratio to the amount of energy given. Remember, in the refrigerator, our interest is in how much heat can be rejected to the high temperature reservoir. So we define a new term which is called the coefficient of performance. And we define the coefficient of performance as the ratio between the heat rejected to the high temperature reservoir to the amount of work that we give to the refrigerator. From the diagram we can see that an amount Q2 is extracted from the cold reservoir, some work W is added to it and heat amounting to Q1 is rejected to the high temperature reservoir. From first law of thermodynamics, Q1 is equal to Q2 plus W. In refrigerator, we use the term coefficient of performance to indicate how well it operates, which is defined as the ratio between desired output Q2 and required input W. So, efficiency E is equal to desired output divided by required input. This is equal to E is equal to Q2 divided by W is equal to Q2 divided by Q1 minus Q2. If the refrigerator works on Carnot cycle, then Q2 divided by Q1 is equal to T2 divided by T1 and efficiency is equal to Q2 divided by Q1 minus Q2 is equal to T2 divided by T1 minus T2 where T2 is temperature inside the refrigerator and T1 is the room temperature. We have seen that heat engines and refrigerators work when we have a high temperature reservoir and a low temperature reservoir. The heat engine gets its heat from the high temperature reservoir, does some work and rejects the other to the low temperature reservoir. The refrigerator takes in some work and uses it to transfer some heat from the low temperature reservoir to the high temperature reservoir. Now in both of these examples, we have seen that heat is present at two different levels. We have heat at a higher temperature and we have heat at a lower temperature. Or in other words, we have an order in the system. Now what happens if I just mix the two reservoirs together? Let's take the example of a turbine. Now a turbine uses steam which is at a higher temperature and expands it in a turbine and rejects its heat in the condenser. Now by separating the two places, a place where I have a high temperature and a place I have a low temperature, I can get some useful work out of the system. But if the steam is just given out into the atmosphere, I cannot get any work out of it. Similarly, when I look at a refrigerator, if I just open the door of a refrigerator so that the high temperature and the low temperature regions become one, then I cannot get anything out of it. Now this leads us to another very important concept of thermodynamics which is called entropy. Entropy is a measure of the disorder of a system or it is a measure of the unavailability of energy. If delta Q 
is the amount of heat added to a system at a constant temperature T, then the change in entropy delta S is given by delta S is equal to delta Q divided by T. The heat must be added to the system reversibly, which means that if I take out the heat, the system should go through the same process as when heat is being added to it. It should follow identical path when heat is being added or when heat is being extracted. Now here we learn another fact that entropy is one of the state variables of a gas, just like pressure, volume, temperature and internal energy. This also is a state variable and it measures the state of disorder of a system. Now we will give two more statements of thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics, which will take entropy into account. Natural processes tend to proceed towards a state of greater disorder. If an isolated system undergoes change, it will change in such a way that its entropy either remain constant or tends to increase. In today's program, we have discussed heat engines, second law of thermodynamics, refrigerators and heat pumps, and entropy. Now, this brings us to the end of this program. I hope you have learned something new and enjoyed watching this program. Khuda Hafiz.